Good on microphone. Okay. Um, ah, welcome to the ZFF Masters oh, here at nice. the Arena Four. Right, it's nice, comfortable chairs. Yeah. We're going to be sitting here for an hour. Um, we met last year for Marlow, which you presented here at the 18th Zurich Film Festival. And I recall you telling me and also some of the guests that it was very refreshing to speak German yes. with the audience. Uh, obviously, you are from Germany, but we will stick to English, ladies and gentlemen, because we have some international guests here as well, if you don't mind. But now it's been a few, I think, trips to Switzerland. Not too many. No, is this your third? Your second? Second. Oh, second. Yeah. I read somewhere that you were here once or twice before that. So it's a bit yeah. tough to ask that question of what your impression <laughs> is of our little nation here. But did you get to experience a little something Well, this time? time, can I tell you, I don't know if you remember if you were here last year, it was the most horrendous weather last year. And I remember getting wet on the red car uh, green carpet. And uh, it was so gray. Our flights were, like, terribly delayed. And this time, it's like the sun came up. I'm loving it. It's so beautiful. Lucky well, you. We, we, I'm not sure if we do remember last year, but it usually rains around this time of the yeah. year. But uh, yeah, you're right. It is definitely a beautiful, beautiful fall here. So end peaceful. Of September, yeah. early October. I wanna, we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to cover. Obviously, pretty much uh, everything about your career. But I wanted to start at your humble beginnings um, <laughs> in Germany. I heard that you grew up in a Catholic family and went to Catholic school. Is that correct? I went to Catholic school. Ca you went to Catholic school. Not so Catholic family. Not so Catholic, Catholic family. <laughs> and one of your dreams was to be a ballet dancer at early mm -hmm. age. Yes. Um, tell us about that before we dive a little bit into your model career. What, how would you describe your youth until that 15 years of age when you moved to Paris? Well, I grew up so in the small village of Algemissen, close to Hildesheim close to Hanover. <laughs> so, um, you know, at the time it was a very small village. You know, everybody knew each other. And I grew up pretty, you know, in a way idyllic, you know, like living um, on the forest, um, being outside all day. But uh, not, so, not so happy home life. But, um, you know, I grew up uh, going to ballet and, and feeling like that, that artistic part of, of dancing and music was, was really something that uh, made me dream, yeah, so. And did you ever pursue any of the dancing part? Well, I, I studied with the Royal Academy of London, so even as a child, I would go to London in my holidays to, you know, to do like internships there. Um, I pretty early on at 13, I mean, I started dan dancing at two, but, um, at 13, I had an injury on my knee, and so that kind of took me out of dancing for a while, and then I, I kind of didn't go back. You know, it was, it was a pretty tough life, and I think as my body was changing, um, I realized that I wasn't gonna be a prima ballerina, you know. You did pursue, though, a modeling career, as we probably all know quite well, and you moved to Paris at the age tender age of 15. <laughs> I know that's part of the modeling life, but not everyone, uh, you know, has that sort of, uh, uh, how do you say that, the guts to kind of like leave home and move to Paris <laughs> at that young age. Tell us a bit about that time when you moved to Paris in those, those early years. You know, it was pretty great. It's hard to imagine today, like, if I think about letting my own daughter <laughs> go to Paris at 15 without a cell phone or a computer, it's like, <laughs> yeah, definitely not. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it was a different time. Uh, like I said, my situation at home wasn't that great um, you know my parents were splitting up and my mom was struggling and so she allowed me to pursue uh, modeling um, I had won this contest in Germany and I really wanted to leave and see what's you know what's going on in Paris I've always dreamt about going to Paris and uh, I didn't want to come home you know and my mom said okay you can take a sabbatical which was also because my the principal of my school which was very Catholic just said, um, you know, I was missing a lot of classes because I was working. And he said, you're going to have to make a decision whether or not you want to make your abitur or um, you're going to, you know, you're going to be a model. Which was really uh, not fair because I was passing the tests. I, you know, I wasn't a great student, but I, I got through. Um, so, you know, to me at the time and, and still today when I think back, I really felt like, what a D-I-C-K, you know. He's really, like, asking me to choose between my dreams and my future possibly or you know just finish being present for tests you know and so my mom let me um, take a sabbatical and said if I hear anything you're coming back and so I didn't. 
and why Paris and not another fashion city? And, and what was your sort of, did you have that sort of interest in France and the French culture from, from that age onwards? Or did that only happen after you moved to Paris? No, if I wanted to go to Paris, originally they wanted me to go to New York and my mom said that's too far away. You know, again, in those days there were no cell phones and she just, she was worried. Um, so she said, Paris, you know, it's close enough, you can do that. And, and so I did and um, my mom loved Paris. I was conceived in Paris. So she, her honeymoon was in France, you know, so I, she, she was happy for me to go. And what was sort of your, when you look back, kind of the living circumstances, how were you like, do you have good memories of the first yeah. apartment and all that kind of <laughs> stuff? Was it a beautiful place? It was not beautiful, but okay. it was beautiful to me. Um, you know, we lived with, um, because I wasn't of age, um, the agency put me into those, you know, modeling apartments you hear about. But again, different times since there was no one who could reach us. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Tell us about, we're not going to go into the <laughs> details. I know, I, know that, I know that you've worked for a lot of big fashion houses, so you've obviously achieved quite a bit as well as a model. But what was the defining moment for you when you kind of realized, ooh, acting, I, I might uh, catch an acting bug? So I think it was kind of the discovery of movies and cinema moving to France. Um, um, I had a, um, you know, I, I grew up like loving La Boom. I don't know if you remember those shows with Sophie Marceau. And I was just in love with Sophie Marceau, you know, and, and the whole French culture. And, you know, I wanted a boyfriend named Pierre, <laughs> which ended up being true. Um, and uh, he loved French cinema. And he made me discover, um, you know, the plethora that is the French cinema of the 60s, Les, les Sautés, Le Louche, all, the, all these great French filmmakers. And uh, my big idol always has been was Romy Schneider. And so I discovered all her work that she did in France. And after a while, modeling was very limiting, you know? I felt um, I was a little bored by, by the process, and, and then so I decided to go to drama school in Paris. And how long was that school? The school would have been three years. Um, I went for two and then got a job and, you know, started working. So right after school, you, you were able mm -hmm. to land your first roles. Um, the, I thoroughly enjoyed watching a lot of your films over the last few weeks. Um, it was very interesting to see, again, the diverse range of films and, and roles that you've played. Um, I, I think uh, one of your first few films was with Dennis Hopper, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> and then you had um, also, of course, your, your sort of Hollywood breakthrough with, with Troy. Looking back uh, during uh, at those days, what, what can you tell us about some of those first early gigs that you landed and how you felt about it and how it was working on set? Um, I mean, I remember it being very exhilarating, you know, in a, in a way, when I look back now, I realize how quickly things happened for me. Uh, but, um, you know, I've really had zero experience being in front of the camera. And even my first job that I got, I lied through my teeth, you know, saying I, of course, knew how to be in front of the camera, which I truly had zero idea. And I think Dennis Hopper was like the first one who a was a bigger part, but also I played his daughter in this movie, and so he pretty quickly was on to me, and he he taught me, you know, like the basics, like if you can't see the camera, the camera can't see you. Oh, you know, <laughs> so there was a steep learning curve, um, and then pretty much my second or third, I think my second third film was Troy, um, and I just remember being in over my head. You know, it was exhilarating, of course. But it was a circus, you know, the sets were huge and, uh, you know, helicopter, like paparazzi helicopters for Brad Pitt. And it was just, it was crazy. And Brad was at the height of his career yeah. as well. Was that something that you kind of just embraced? It's something when you get, and I don't know if many of us have experienced that, but when you get thrown into that situation, do you just roll with it, I assume? Or, or how nervous did it make you? Or how do you navigate that? You just go with it or are you the kind of shy one in the background and let Brad have his moments and whatever <laughs> moments there were, obviously, <laughs> but uh, describe that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, on set was, you know, on set every actor I've ever worked with, famous or not, is just an actor, right? So when you're on set, you're in this bubble of security and you're trying to make the best scene or get the best scene that you can. So on set, I'm, I wasn't so nervous, you know? I mean, I was nervous because I wanted to do well um, and I wanted to sort of, you know, be on par with those great actors 
offset, I was pretty nervous, you know, um, but I didn't really <laughs> realize what a circus it would be. The, the press in Germany, I remember when the movie was coming out, the press in Germany was very, very tough on me. Like they were, you know, they, they found my father who I hadn't seen since I was 13. They made up stories uh, that weren't true. Like it was just outrageously, A, unfair, unnecessary, but really, really harsh, you know? And I remember being really shaken by that. I remember that can, like the movie premiere in can, being very, very insecure and very sad, um, you know, because my mom was there and she was shaken. And I was just, oh my God, is, is this what it's going to be? Forever, like I can't deal with this. And my and um, it was really Brad who Brad Pitt who was incredibly kind because he could see I was so upset. And he uh, came to my room and he said, "Listen, I've heard you know I've heard some things and like I just want you to know you're one of us now. And these things are just don't let them get to you. You're gonna be fine, you know." And he was just so kind. Honestly, I remember that it changed really a lot of a lot of things for me. He was incredibly kind. Seems that you managed to kind of make bigger steps by learning from some of those very, very established yeah, for individuals. Sure. Um, there was um, an unfortunate moment that you talked about in one of your interviews, I think it was recently, about the screen tests that you had for Troy, when you really felt, uh, you know, this Hollywood chauvinistic uh, kind of world of auditioning where they put you in your costume and kind of like just treat you like a piece <laughs> of meat. Is that... Was that yeah, but you know, again, let's let's it's a it's a it's a headline that okay. media likes to run with. Let's put it into perspective. I was a an actress no one has, has ever heard of. Mm. The studio didn't necessarily want to hire me. It was really Wolfgang Peterson who fought for me. Um, they thought they thought I was too skinny. They you know whatever they thought. So he wanted to convince them, and I just remember being. You know, I the, the the casting process for Troy was incredibly long, right? I, I I was filming, so I couldn't go to a casting office, so I filmed myself in my hotel room and I sent it in, and then I didn't hear for months and months and months. So I, you know, I thought, well, it's 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 done. You know, I didn't have an agent in America, never been to Hollywood, and then they called back and they asked me to come to London to do a screen test, and I met Wolfgang. And uh, and that went really well. Like you know, we got along, and it was great. And then I didn't hear for a couple months. And then I had to fly to Hollywood, right, to do a screen test in the in the studios, like the dream. So I was incredibly nervous. They did all the screen tests. I was in in a wig, and um, you know, the costumes. They were trying to make me look um, rounder, <laughs> because in the days, um, in the, like during Troy, I mean, you know, in those in those times. Um, wealth was measured by how round you were, right? It was uh, you were you were rich if you had shape, which I didn't. Um, so they were trying to make me look rounder, and so they you know propped me up. And um, he said, "Well, let's you know we have to meet the head of the studio. I want you to go in 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 costume." And it was just one of those moments where you know you're sitting in an office full of old men um, who look you up and down, you know, and and he just didn't say much and then I, I could tell that he wasn't convinced and then he just you know kind of looked at me and was like why do you think he should be Helm of Troy you know like to which I said I have no clue I don't know I guess I don't know you know because I'd like to I don't know so it was just one of those moments where I was made to feel very and I felt like I felt like I was you know presented in a way that wasn't me at all but it's not to the point where you know I felt like I got me too it you know okay um, if there's people in the audience or in general, young people who kind of would like to pursue that, um, I guess one question I wanted to ask is, you know, the auditioning process is, is such a, a big process of an actor or an actress's life in the beginning phase, especially, um, and it can be quite, um, scary to stand in front of these people, like what you just described, you could be the best actress in the world, but still you have to master those moments. What advice can you give generally for, for, I know you have an unusual career, but um, for young people, I was just asked the other day and I try to give mine, but what, what would your advice be if, if, if you gave one or two? I would, I would say work your, work your butt off for, the, for an audition in, in the sense of make sure you know your lines. You, you need to have a take on the, uh, on the part, right? So 
they're not going to direct you, really, in an audition. They want to see what you think of the role. So whether or not that's what they're looking for, but you need to come in and show them what you think this part is. Um, like I remember, for example, for uh, Inglourious Bastards, which I was kind of over the phase of having to audition, but Tarantino didn't want to hire me. He had, he had written the role for somebody else. He wanted someone authentically German, which he thought I wasn't. <laughs> you know, you're never right for anything. So he, I had to fly myself to Germany on my own dime because he was there, you know, auditioning everyone. And he asked me to learn 15 pages of dialogue in German and in English. It was incredibly hard. I had two days to prep for those scenes, you know. But I knew that if I got these lines right, that there was no way he wasn't going to hire me because I knew I was right for the part, you know. And so when I came in, uh, I had to read with him. There was no camera. Like he, he auditions, you know, just with himself. And uh, I came in, and he was like, well, you can, you can take your script. I said, I don't need my script. That alone impressed him because it truly was 15 pages. Um, and I just, you know, I did it. I was Bridget von Hammer's work. And I could see it in the audition. Like, he, he was, like, there was no way he wasn't going to hire me, you know. And I really feel that our auditions, they suck. It's not fun. Like, it really isn't. But if you know your stuff and you have a good take on what this, this is, like, no one wants to hire an actor who's like, well, what do you think? Should I do it like this? How about this, you know? It's one thing y you propose something and then they say, okay, now let's try this. And they can see how flexible you are and how you can change. But you don't want to come across as like someone who's just like, uh, what do you need me to do, you know? Do you feel like you, got, you have to stick to the script and the words or are you able to improvise a little bit in those auditions? In audition, I would not suggest you switching it up. Every director is different. Like Tarantino is someone who will break a scene if you forget one word. Like, he really is very anal about his lines. Other directors, you know, they welcome your input. So, it depends. So, we fast forwarded, obviously, National Treasure, copying Beethoven, a bunch of different things. But I did want to get to um, Inglorious Bastards, because probably for many of you as well, one of my favorite films of all time, including <laughs> many of the greatest scenes of all time, including your tavern scene. Mm -hmm. um, you've already shared a little bit about uh, Quentin, but how was he on set? And obviously, I have to ask as well, how were some of the other amazing actors on set, such as Christoph Waltz? Of course, you worked with Brad before, but tell us a bit about the dynamics um, when while shooting a Quentin Tarantino film on set. Um, on set is pretty cool. I mean, he, it's very hard to get the job, as I mentioned, right? Like his, his casting process is very intense. But once you're chosen, it's kind of like he, he loves you already. You can't really do wrong, you know? He, he'll be there to support you. What's different for him is like he sits right next to the camera, usually a director, you know, will sit by a monitor and he's not really in the room where the scene happens. So he sits right next to camera, which is very weird, right? You, he's literally staring at you and like laughing if he thinks that. So it's very hard not to look at him. <laughs> Definitely takes getting used to. But um, he like he just loves actors and he loves making movies, right? So it's 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 a great atmosphere. Um, for the fun of it, staying in chronological order, I think Inglourious Bastards was around 2009. 2012 marked another milestone in your career with uh, playing Marie Antoinette, or at least the, that was when the movie was released, probably was shot a little bit uh, mm -hmm. sooner than that. Um, obviously, a very historic figure in, in French history. Um, I would have assumed preparation to play French Queen was, was quite an interesting one. Tell us <laughs> about how you prepared for that role and how you prepare in general. You know, that was like one of those other moments in my life where I felt like, I mean, who else in France is going to play Marie Antoinette, you know? I'm German. Like, how many Germans are going to be right for this part, you know, in, in France? Benoit Jacot is an amazing director. He's He's been famous for, um, you know, making female-centered films for a long time. So I knew he was going to be very welcoming. Um, the movie itself was technically very difficult for me. It's old French, so it's not a, like really like a spoken French. So to learn it was very hard for me. There's lots of m monologues, I remember. But it was like a dream come true. We were shooting in Versailles, you know, and you're putting on those outfits. And um, in a way, it almost 
you know, I didn't have to try very hard, you know. Um, and Benoit is also a director who well, you know, a lot of, m I found, a lot of men can be um, scared of the female, what they call hysteria, right? Emotions, very strong emotions. They, they, they sort of uh, tense up. And Benoit, like there's the scene, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but there's a, a scene in the film where, you know, she realizes it's the end and they're gonna come for her and it's the end of life as she knows it and she sort of breaks down and she, she freaks out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember filming that scene, which by the way, the whole movie is lit by candlelight, which is also different, right? Like it was the, one of the first films that was shot entirely digitally, which at the time I guess was still a novelty. So they wanted to, the film to look a certain way. Um, so they, the, the DP lit everything by candles. So it was incredibly beautiful, very hot, but very beautiful. So um, I remember like shooting that scene and it was kind of an out of body experience because I didn't really know what I was gonna do, but then, you know, things just happened. And it was, it was so quiet on set. I was like, oh God, he's gonna come for me. What happened? You know, he was gonna say it's too hysterical. It's, it's like, you know, rein it back in, Diane. And, uh, and he came and he had tears in his eyes and he like hugged me, he was so sweet, you know? It was like, what, such a great experience. But he's also a director. I remember one day he came into, um, and I was getting ready, and he came in and he had the script of the, the scenes of the day and he was like, okay, so when you say Kavwesh, it'd be great if you start crying on that line. Okay, no problem, like what? <laughs> you know, so every director is different, you know? Uh, Les Adieux à la Reine, if you have the chance to watch it, if you haven't watched it already, definitely you should. And yeah, the end, uh, very powerful and a great scene. Um, I know this is a recurring theme and a, a recurring question, uh, but I think it still makes you quite unique, uh, which is jumping between the languages so effortlessly. And I think that, yeah, if you look at a lot of the great German actors who have kind of been able to cross over to the US and some of them, you know, but a lot of them kept playing sort of German roles just because of the accent nature and whatnot. I guess it's a simple question, but maybe, I don't know, for me it's not also the, also the easiest to understand. How, uh, how did you embrace the French language that well and the English language that well? And speaking it well is one thing, but with, with such a flawless accent, how, how is this that just natural or? Watch I mean, I have an accent in French. Y I mean you know, you might not be able to necessarily hear it, but. Trust the me, French. the French <laughs> remind <laughs> me that I do. <laughs> I'm sure they, they make you <laughs> know of that, right? <laughs> no, but, but what's very funny is if I'm in a good movie, I'm French. Terrible movie, Franco-Allemande. <laughs> 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 no, I'm joking, but uh, I guess because I lived in France for so long before I started acting, you know, um, and I didn't learn French in school, so I, um, I crash coursed it just living there because nobody at the time, People spoke English, but you know how it is. Like they say one word in English to make you feel better and then dinner happens and everybody switches back to French, you know? So after six months of having dinner by myself, basically, I decided I really gotta get a hang of it. What about English? That just... Well, English, I, I learned in school, so I spoke it well, but the uh, accent took a lot of work o over the years. Um, accent training. Accent work, mm. yeah, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I have somewhat of a talent or an ear for languages because it's true, not everybody can, can really. erase it. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I'm bilingual and I feel that sometimes when I speak either English or German that, you know, it's me, I mean, I'm Max, I don't change, or I don't try to change, but like, I feel that you adapt a little bit culturally in some ways. Do you feel that way when, when you feel more yeah, French? Yeah, I do, I do. Uh, it's, it's unconscious, you know, right. I don't mean to, but I, I do think in French I tend to be I think a little bit softer than maybe in English or in German, you know. Definitely uh, uh, um, in, in the fade, you know, there's a natural toughness to the character, you know, like a natural, I guess, Germanness to the character that uh, came by itself, you know. Uh, one of the big differences, I'm sure, working in so many different markets are the different um, industries. I mean, in the, end, in the end of the day, a film is a film, but how would you describe the key differences between, you know, producing or shooting a film in Germany, France, and then, of course, the U.S. will be the big differentiator there, I assume. Studio films um, I don't know so much about Germany, you know, because okay. I've only really had right. that one experience, right. but I know in France the, the huge fundamental difference between American films and French films is 
that cinema in France is considered cultural, right? So the state gives aids to the to financing France. movies, and it's um, you know it's TV channels that that, that Canal Plus, you know, Orange, who finance films plus privately funded um, producers. And in the U.S., at least the um, studio system, and which is part of what this strike is is about is that they're owned by big co corporation, right? The, so like, I don't know, AT&T, Coca-Cola, are really who owns Warner Brothers and all those studios. So they're, they're not really at the pursuit of an artistic endeavor, right? So it's meant to be profitable. A director is someone you hire. Um, and it's really the role of a producer who is in a way more important because he's there to make sure that the money they, they're getting is being put on screen. In France, obviously they want to make money, but a producer is really there to help bring the director's vision to life. And so actors and directors are usually very tight-knit and have a, um, a creative conversation, right? The work of an actor is considered artistic, right? So there's a true exchange of, of wanting to make something artistic. In America, an actor at least the studios often look down onto, you know? And so that's the one of the core reasons what's happening in the US is like the artistic side of things, writers, um, actors, and the studios are so far apart of what they're trying to make and what they think is worthwhile, not just money, but time, respect. So there's it's a, a very preca precarious time in America because I think the future of cinema in America is challenged right now. Of course, there will be the independent film, you know, that will come through, and there's great films that come out of America, but they're usually not produced by studios, right? So, which is also why some actors like Jessica, who was here, are able to come because they they have no problem agreeing to the interim agreement and of what SAG, you know, wants for their members. But the studios, it's 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 tough. It's a shame because it's become such a big money game. I mean, these movies, the budgets are, are getting bigger and bigger, and it's just franchises and yeah. nothing much original anymore. So that's that's really um, pretty sad. Um, so in terms of your career, I guess what's amazing to any successful actress or actor is, you know, and I'm fortunate to have some friends who've kind of made it, and but then like just to stay there and to maintain that. And once you get, get to a certain standard, maybe it's a little bit easier, but... Still, I would assume that even for you, right, you gotta be, and your team has to be very, I don't know if you have a big team, but like you have to be very specific about the next project and the project after and, and, and so forth. And you got some interesting stuff coming that we wanna talk about as well. But how do you pick your projects? And especially when you mention something like French cinema or you know Hollywood, like you wanna be able to balance it both, I assume. And, and how do you pick your, 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 f your future projects? It depends. A lot of the times things come to you, right? You're not, you. Some, some a lot of the times it's luck too to be, you know, at the right time in the right place. There's so many things in America that contribute to the fact that you get hired. You know, I've certainly been in movies because I checked certain boxes finance-wise. You know, they they want to shoot in Europe because they get a, tr a tax credit, so they have to hire a European. Check, Diane Kruger is available. You know, so it's I you you kind of have to put your ego in check sometimes. You know. Um, which doesn't mean that you're not going to be as good as somebody else that they really want it. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a game. It's, it's, um, if you're lucky, you have a lot of choice. And then sometimes you just got to, you know, power through. I definitely want to quickly touch on Aus dem Nichts, um, In the Fade, the English uh, title, which was, as you said, uh, your only but also your first German film. Um, with the uh, talented uh, director Fatih Akin, um, which uh, garnered the Best Actress Award at the Cannes Film Festival. Tell us about that film, which, by the way, you have to watch as well if you haven't. I loved it. It was probably one of my favorites, which I was a little bit surprised. Not, I mean, maybe that's the wrong way to say, but I, from all the films, I probably would not have expected that that's one of my favorites. But you did such a great job. Tell us about working with Fatih and, yeah, that moment in your life when you won that Cannes Prize. Honestly, that, that, that is pure luck. You know, Fadi was a dream for me to work with. I had met him five years prior to In the Fate in, in Cannes. Um, I was a jury member. 
and uh, coming out of Germany, you know, I grew up with his films. I mean, I loved his movies. And I've, you know, I didn't have, I still don't have that many um, job offers, you know, from Germany. And I always thought, oh, wow, you know, if I had my pick, I would want to work with Fadi. So I was there. He had a film, um, not in competition, but he was screening a film. And so I, I, I asked to meet him. I went to a party that he was DJing. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, listen, you know, if you ever have a movie for me, I love your movies, you know, I would love to work for, for you. Which is pretty ballsy, because when you knew his work up until then, it's Turkish people. He makes films about Turkish immigrants, <laughs> you know, so it didn't really fit the, <laughs> um, the thing, you know. I think even he was a little taken aback, but he was like, yeah, cool. he's super nice. And then five years later, you know, uh, he sends me the script. And honestly, it was like one of those moments where I read it, because uh, I could, first of all, couldn't believe that he sent it to me. And then I read it in 20 minutes, and I just remember sitting on my couch. I was in New York, and I was like, this is the role of a lifetime. I got to call him right now, because I know he's going to change his mind, you know? So, and I did. I was like, don't change your mind. It's me. No, really, it's me. And he was like, well, let me come to Paris, you know, and um, let's meet. Like, he, he didn't really say it's you. You know, he was kind of... I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I flew to Paris, and I was like, oh, he's going to come to my nice French apartment in Paris, and, you know, he's going to be like, definitely not. This bourgeoise, you know, is never going to be, you know, cool enough to be in my film. So I remember this is, I mean, now I look back and I'm smiling, and I've told him, like, so li literally, I hate beer. I bought a six-pack of beer. I bought, like, I took my jeans, I ripped them, and I wore like a white fetish thing and I didn't wash my hair for two days thinking, yeah, he's gonna look at me and he's gonna think that's me, right? And, and I remember him like, so he, he arrives and I'm you know, st standing by the door and he's coming up the stairs and he looked at me and he was, <laughs> I could see him go. <laughs> and I said, hey, you want a beer? And he goes, no, I hate beer, you have wine? I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> so anyways, we got along. <laughs> <laughs> probably didn't like the ripped jeans either, right? <laughs> um, well, we got exciting news. You probably already know about it, but you and Fatih will be potentially, I think, or I don't know if it's signed and sealed, working again it again, maybe, on that Marlene yeah, yeah, Dietrich. Yeah, yeah uh, it's in the works. It's in the works, mm -hmm. but I guess uh, the rumors are out there um, that you might be playing Marlene, right, in a series. Yeah, although now we're, now we're just debating whether okay. it should be a movie or not. So okay. it's still yeah. okay. 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 Well, either way, I think we would all <laughs> love it's and, coming. Go and go and watch that. Uh, you are here to uh, not only receive the Golden Eye Awards, but you are also presenting your latest film, Visions, which I've had the pleasure of watching in one of the industry screenings. Um, I hope some of you. Is anyone coming tonight? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, awesome. It's going to be a fun premiere, and it's going to be a fun film. Um, and of course, as always, not easy to talk about a film uh, because we don't want to give too much away, but can you share with the audience and maybe for those of you who still um, are wondering what you're doing tonight, um, <laughs> what is the film about um, and what intrigued you to be part of it? So the movie's about um, Estelle, who's a um, pilot, and she is um, married um, you know, to uh, Mathieu Kasowitz, not too shabby. And, and, you know, they have a really good life. You can, you know, they have a very nice car, very nice house. Um, life seems to be going just fine. And Estelle runs into uh, an old girlfriend of hers that we come to understand they had a big love story when they were 18. And so um, that, that ends up being quite the turn, quite the turn in events, yeah. The rest you shall see later. Um, Golden Eye, quickly, um, maybe just a few words of what that means to you to receive awards. Is that something whereby you go, it's nice to get some recognition for all the hard work because people don't <laughs> always see what happens in the many weeks and months and years of building such a career? Or is it just another <laughs> heavy golden round thing <laughs> in your house? No, you know what? It's. Um, at first, I was like, I'm not that old, you know. And then I was, it, I, it stopped me. What they, so they sent me this reel, right, that they put together. And I have to say, it made me stop and reflect. And I, 
I, you know, obviously I can see the years pass on, on screen, right? And I was like, well, you have done a lot of work, I guess. And it made, it, it's made me really, uh, I'm very emotional about it. I have to say, I feel very um, touched that it's not gone unnoticed, you know? Really, I'm really moved. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And it's the first time I'm getting anything like that. <laughs> so um, I, I'm really looking forward to tonight. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is your, you have a daughter, um, Nova, who's uh, four years old, if I'm not mistaken, turning five soon. Um, She's probably too young to see that highlight reel, right? But you probably at some point want to show her this is what mommy has done all her life. Oh, yeah. She'd be like, why are you crying, mom? Why do you keep crying? <laughs> yeah, she's not quite. I mean, she knows that both of her parents are actors. She's come to set, like, um, especially in Visions, you know, last summer. So she, she was with us the whole time. It's a little boring to her. Um, except when I was a pilot, she came to see me pilot uh, a plane, so now every time you take a plane, she tells everybody that I can fly the plane, <laughs> which is so super cute. But she's not, you know, she's not, if, if anything, she hates it because I'm away from her, you know? Like this like this morning I talked to her and she's in New York and um, she's like, when you stop being an actress? When are you coming home? <laughs> yeah, that's cute. I can imagine. All right, it is almost time. I have one final question and then I'd love to open up to all of you. So if you have a question, then please, yes, give me just one, one final question because it's quite exciting <laughs> what's happening with your coming films. There's two films in the pipeline. No, actually, there's, well, two films with David Cronenberg that you've already shot. One of them one. or both of them? One of them. It's, I, I'm there's one. Just one. one. Oh, just one. Okay. Yeah. And um, The Shrouds, where you play three yeah. different roles, right? Can That's you give right. us just a little bit of a taste of what, because uh, it's been a dream to work with him, right? Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, so this film, you know, I haven't seen it obviously yet, we just finished uh, filming it, but um, I think it's most likely his most personal film because it talks about him and the passing of his wife. Um, so Vincent Cassell plays Cronenberg pretty much and uh, I played his, his wife and his wife's sister <laughs> and another character you'll see so it it felt like um i was very emotional filming it because i kn you know it, i knew it was very cl close to him and i think because of it he was very he was a little bit detached you know he i mean he obviously was involved but he i could feel him you know a little bit vulnerable so we'll see i, I hope it's uh, it's gonna be great awesome all right there's a gentleman over there who has his hands up <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. I think it's over time. I think it's become second nature. I think when I first started, um, whenever I would have to get angry or emotional in a movie, my German accent would come up, you know, because <laughs> it's, you know, and, and uh, not so much anymore. And in, f in French, it's... Um, it's an emotional language. I feel like it comes it comes quite natural. I don't know. It's it's not so conscious, you know. I can't I don't really think about it. No. The question was how does the language affect how she plays a scene? Um, yeah, any of the two ladies over there, if you don't mind. Do you have just a microphone just a second. Uh, maybe it's a bit difficult to get in there. Huh? Oh, that's a per that's perfect. So I was wondering, um, out of all of the very special moments that you've had in your career, and like first you had the dream to move to Paris, and then to become an actress, what's like, do you have a key moment where you were like, oh wow, like this is what I've dreamed of, or something that you like remember a lot of gratitude that you felt? I mean, a key moment was, so when I signed on to um, the French acting school, uh, in order to get in, you had to go up on stage and do an improv. And I'd never done that. I'd never really been up on stage, right? So um, preparing it at first, I was very nervous. And I remember 
going on stage and starting, and it, and it was in French, which was also not, you know, not that easy for an improv uh, for me at the time. And I just remember starting, and maybe because I was nervous, it was helping me. But I was getting more and more, uh, you know, emotional, and I, and I, I had like an out of body experience. But I don't really remember what I said or what I did. I just remember, like, it being over and being quiet. And my this lady who was my teacher, she was said, "Oh, welcome. Here's somebody who found what they're gonna do for the rest of their life." You know, so it really was that moment where it was like, "Oh wow, you know, I can do this." Um, and then, you know, I remember in my early years. Uh, being very anxious about getting jobs, you know, making sh I got, whenever I got a job, I was like, oh my God, what's, what's going to be the next project? What's, you know, like, I wish, like, when I look back, I wish I could have just, like, been a little bit more present, you know, and not so worried. Because uh, in a way, I guess, once I had my daughter, all that anxiety fell away, you know, I just, because it, it matters, but my it's not my priority anymore. And all of a sudden, because I do it less, all that's left is joy. You know, I'm there and I'm present, and it's just so much better. <laughs> and it, it's it's in a way easier too because I'm there. You know, I'm not thinking about something else. So, I guess that would be my biggest advice to a young actor or actress: is try to just enjoy the process. And your work gets better too, I assume, right? With well, the work gets better because you're older, so you're bringing right. more stuff, yeah. Yes, the lady in the second, third row. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, cool. yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. I would like to know two things. Um, one is about your relationship to Germany. Do you every now and then still go to Germany because you it's, it's your uh, birth country? And the second one is what is your relationship to theater? I mean, many actors that come from theater and then go to film or vice versa or do both. So did you ever think of doing theater or not at all or just like that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I went to theater school, so I studied classical theater, um, but I've never done it professionally. I would like to, I'd like to, you know, for sure. It's just, I don't know, it's never really, presented itself to me. Um, I'd like to do that, though. When, uh, it'll happen, I'm sure. Um, as to Germany, you know, again, I think since I've become a mom, it is even more important to me than it was before. You know, I've, I've been gone for over 25 years, but I, I didn't expect it. But when once she was born, I was like, okay, kid's got to speak German. You know, she's going to German school. <laughs> Uh, we went to Zult for <laughs> our vacation this time. I'd never been, you know. Um, it's it's very important to me that she she gets you know, she's part of that culture. Yeah. She's growing up trilingual, I assume. Yeah, um, definitely bilingual. bilingual. Uh, the French. When we were living in Paris last year, she went to a bilingual French English school. But you know, she's four, so I mean, she can count to fifty. I mean, she's better than my husband. I mean, my <laughs> fiance. But. <laughs> Do you speak just German with her? Yeah, yeah, because I don't want to confuse, I mean, she hears me speak French all the time, but yeah. I don't want to confuse her. You know, her, her German is just now, you know, passable. Like, mm. she would always respond in English, even if I spoke to her mm. in German, you know, and so now she, she speaks it fluently, but she makes, you know, lots of mistakes, like, die Tisch, or, the, or, you know, stuff like that. All right, I think there was, yep, a lady there in the second row. Thank you, Karina. You mentioned Jessica before, and you did a movie with her, uh, 355, like the female agent. Um, is it just an impression of me, or do now you actor, actresses sorry, um, work more together, like for um, pay equality and stuff like that, that you're bu building a network more and more, um, instead of like, I don't know, 20, 30 years, one didn't have the feeling that you're connected and that you kind of find yeah, together? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would praise Jessica because not every woman can do that, right? She's in a position today where she's not only the producer but also in a position where she can demand that, right? So I applaud her. I, it was funny, we were just talking about it last night because um, she was there with her director and I, they were arriving as I was leaving the dinner and so I just went over to say hi. 
And the director like sprung up and he was like, oh my God, Jessica has been talking about you all night and how, you know, how great and blah, blah, blah. And you know, I was saying to Olivia, who I work with, he, I said, you know, she really is that person who is secure enough in herself and in her um, talent and in her ability to generate content uh, that she that she just has become this person who is an advocate for other women. I really, I really admire her. So, you have a new movie coming up that you also um, dance in ballet as well. Uh, I'm the teacher, too old for the dancer part, but yeah, I'm the teacher who just yells in Russian. It's called Joyka, yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure when it's, it was just in Deauville, but I don't know when it's uh, coming out, but um, it was great for me to go back to, to the dancing roots, you know. Um, I speak a lot of Russian in that movie, though, which was uh, harder than the, the dancing part. <laughs> you found a new personality speaking Russian? I mean, uh, I guess I don't know. It's uh, it's a har to my ears a harsh language, which apparently it's not to Russians. Like I don't know, but uh, to them it's German. Yeah, no, it is. It's true. They think German's harsh. I'm like, really, Russian? <laughs> but um, it was yeah, it was definitely fun. You know, it was great to be. Um, we we were shooting. We shot in Poland, which is so great. I don't know if you've been to. Uh, Poland. It's so great. I think I could live there. It's really wonderful. We have time, unfortunately, only for one more question. Oh, that's a tough one. You can pick. Oh, you already have a microphone. Okay, all right. <laughs> Ladies pick. first, I of have course. A microphone. <laughs> Let's do it. I, just, I was wondering, as I was listening to you uh, telling your life story, if you were, if you ever wanted to go into directing or other areas, because you have so much. Like everybody has been saying, you have so much tell so many cultures, so many personalities within yourself. Is it something you would like to do, explore? Uh, I don't think directing. Um, I don't think I would be a good director. N not so much the work with actors, but just, um, you know, it's a job. Like if you see a great film, a great director, you know, you don't even need actors. It's told by, you know, by the camera. I don't think I have that talent. Producing, certainly, you know, bringing stories to, to people. I'm not great with numbers, so I think it'd be more of a an artistic, you know, input. Um, writing, not so much scripts, but I wrote a children's book. Um, yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> wow! Jeez! I waited. I waited <laughs> for the, the very last I didn't second. Even know you I knew you were gonna. No I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't. I wouldn't say I'm a writer, but I did like that process of of um, you know putting stuff out. I don't know if I'd do it again because this is kind of like you know my story and, and and Nova's story, but it was so great and I I love what I loved the most was going on a book tour because people are very different than cinema people right like it's there they love books and they love stories and it's like the meet and greet with people is very enriching I found that the most gratifying part of the whole process I have to say that's nice you should say that. It's you probably assume a lot of people dread to do that, but I think it's nice to connect with people just like you today. It was really fun <laughs> to have you all here. I hope you all enjoyed it. Did you have a good time? Was it interesting? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Thank you so perfect. much for coming. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we see you all tonight. Have a good day. Yes. Thank you so much, Dan, for Thank coming you. and enjoy the day. Dan Thank Kruger, you. everyone. Thank you. <laughs>